It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Andrew Anzalone. Dr. Anzalone got his bachelor's degree at Brown um, and uh, there, from there went to the medical scientist training program at Columbia. Got his MD and PhD there doing his thesis work in the lab of Virginia Cornish. Uh, and from there um, went to the Broad Institute at Harvard and MIT for a postdoc with uh, Dr. David Liu. And there is where he pioneered development of what he's gonna talk about today, which is prime editing, a novel CRISPR-based search and replace gene editing technology, with the potential to correct uh, single gene uh, variants and, and other um, genetic lesions associated with human disease. Um, we're really excited to have Andrew here for those who got to hear his PMMS talk yesterday. Um, this will be a deeper dive into some of the science behind um, what they're doing. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Well, first, just thank you for the introduction and thanks so much for the invitation here. It's, uh, I have to say, very encouraging and inspiring to see the dedication to research and investigation in the pediatrics department here at WashU and uh, really uh, look forward to, to speaking with, with you guys uh, throughout the day. Um, so uh, no, I, I I did all of my, a lot of the work that I'll show in the first half of this presentation um, at the Broad Institute in David Liu's lab. I'm going to try to tell the story a little bit about how the uh, sort of uh, technology was uh, designed and how we progressed through developing it. In the second half of the talk, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about applications uh, that we're pursuing at Prime Medicine, which is where I currently work. And I lead the Prime Editing Platform team there, where we work to develop the technology further for these therapeutic applications. So. Uh, we're based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, and, and I hope you, somebody, everybody here finds uh, at least one of those two parts uh, interesting and thought-provoking. So um, just real quickly, my disclosures, I'm an employee at Prime Medicine, so uh, you probably already know. So I'm going to just start off with really what the problem is, and I really like to use this, this graphic, which depicts um, uh, different variants in the ClinBar database uh, defined as pathogenic. This is a little outdated now, but uh, this, this particular graphic shows 75,000 different variants and breaks them down uh, by what type of mutation they are. Um, and so the, the pie chart here shows um, sort of the distribution of these different variants. And you can see that uh, about 50% of these variants, so the blue and red uh, sectors are just simple point mutations, which are further broken down into transition point mutations, which are uh, substitutions of purines for other purine or uh, pyrimidine for another pyrimidine. Uh, and transversion point mutations, which interconvert purine and primidine bases. So but collectively, these are uh, about 50% of all those variants. Uh, and then there's another large chunk of variants that uh, are, uh, are made up of, of deletions or small insertions or small duplications, uh, which contribute another uh, substantial percentage of this pie. And so these variants cause a lot of the diseases that you all have heard of and probably seen patients who have. They're, you know, a common allele that causes hemochromatosis is simple G to A transition point mutation. Of course, the, the very famous variant that causes sickle cell disease is a transversion A to T mutation in beta hemoglobin. Uh, three nucleotide deletion, common, very common allele in cystic fibrosis, the delta 508 allele. And then a, a common four nucleotide uh, uh, duplication that uh, causes uh, many uh, cases of Tay-Sachs disease. So these are sort of the, uh, when you think of gene editing, these are sort of the problems you think about. How can we fix these different types of mutations? And of course, it's even more complex to think about how you would do that in a patient, but strictly from the gene editing standpoint, this is actually quite a well-defined problem. This is pretty clear what we have to do. So that's one of the reasons I really like gene editing. It's, it's a very clear uh, and well-defined problem. Um, so, so that's what we want to do. And so, uh, you know, that wasn't really even possible to think about doing, I'd say maybe 15 years ago. Um, but uh, about a decade ago now, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system came on the scene. Uh, and this has really been revolutionary. Uh, and not to go too much detail on how this works, but uh, it's really a two-component system. One of the components is this Cas9 or Cas nuclease enzyme, uh, and it partners with a guide RNA sequence, uh, com commonly called a single guide RNA, uh, that actually programs the location in the genome that you'd like to target for editing. So um, uh, the majority of this RNA can be held constant, but a small piece, about 20 bases, uh, can be designed to specifically target a region of interest and it simply just matches that sequence in the genome that you'd like to target. Um, so this is really the idea of uh, programmability and 
Of course, prior generations of gene editing tools like zinc fingers and talons also had this design, uh, this programmability in principle, but the CRISPR-Cas system just makes it incredibly seamless and, it, and it's very robust. So uh, it's very easy to one day target a particular location in the genome and on the next day, uh, change where you want to target and, and make a new uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system that does that. Um, so, so what can you do with this uh, particular system? Well, uh, right out of the box, the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, enzyme uh, has evolved to generate double-strand breaks. So it makes two cuts in the DNA um, and that resulting uh, product can be repaired by cells uh, by a couple of pathways. And, and simpl to simplify, you can break it into two major pathways. The first is an end joining pathway. Uh, and you can do different things with this. If, if you don't provide any donor DNA and you just let the cell fix that double strand break, uh, sometimes it can perfectly repair it and stitch it back together again without any changes made to that DNA. But in, in other cases, It'll end up making these small insertions or deletions, which we call indels, uh, that can be really uh, uh, useful for disrupting a gene. So a lot of CRISPR-Cas9 applications are, are knockout applications, uh, but these aren't really program. These aren't really controllable, so you can't necessarily uh, uh, tell the cell which of these particular outcomes to make. It's usually a, a large mixture of these outcomes. You can also use these adjoining pathways to knock in pieces of double-stranded DNA that you introduce. So at that break site. This DNA can be inserted, but it's difficult to control the orientation uh, of this integration. And again, it's always competing with these other pathways that generate probably undesired uh, products. So the alternative arm of DNA repair, one that we would ideally like to use is homology-directed repair or, or homologous recombination. Um, and, and this allows us to provide a DNA template. Uh, it could be a small single-stranded uh, piece of DNA, or it could be a larger double-stranded piece of DNA. You can make basically any type of edit that you can imagine uh, with this system. Uh, in principle, you can uh, make point mutations or small insertions or deletions by uh, encoding that on the template. You can also knock in entire genes and the knock in would be uh, in a specific orientation based on the homology arms you provide on this donor. And so you can potentially get an entire gene to knock in. And of course we use this regularly for research applications um, in, in many different organisms and cell types. Um, but the big challenge here, and one that I didn't really even appreciate before I got into gene editing, was that uh, these double-strand break pathways, uh, and in particular the homology-directed repair pathway, isn't really suited uh, to, to be used in uh, most cell types that are of therapeutic interest. So many primary cells, and especially non-dividing cells, don't really use homology-directed repair to repair their double-strand breaks. They predominantly use these adjoining pathways that lead to gene disruption. And, and um, moreover, the, the requirement to deliver the DNA donor template uh, uh, makes it even more challenging to apply therapeutically. So this was really the problem when I started my postdoc that you know, I set out to solve. How, how can we still take advantage of these really amazing principles of nucleic acid encoded edit information, um, but, but use an alternative mechanism that doesn't depend on this, this repair pathway that's really just not uh, active uh, in the cells that we would like to edit. So that got me kind of thinking about this, this guide RNA molecule, which is really the magic behind the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Um, you know, this 20 nucleotide sequence right here that's written in ends, you can really put in any sequence you want. And again, uh, more or less target any place in the genome that you'd like. And that's the RNA programming the targeting. So the question is, can we also use the RNA to program the edit? You know, and, and as opposed to using a DNA donor template, you actually put that edit information into this guide RNA. And in fact, that RNA is already there at the target locus that you're trying to edit. So conveniently, it's gonna be localized to the region of the genome of interest to, to begin with. Um, you know, of course, we would require a, a mechanism for transferring that information from RNA to DNA. And of course, that's reverse transcription. Um, and the, the question of what really came down to if we could get the molecular machinery to, to copy from RNA uh, uh, into the DNA, can there be a way that uh, mechanism for that to then be incorporated uh, into the uh, double-stranded DNA and make a permanent edit. So these were some, some of the questions that we set out with trying to, to figure out and to answer. Um, so, so how would we go about doing this? So uh, one of the big uh, challenges, as I mentioned before, uh, around getting precision editing with the CRISPR-Cas9 system is that when you generate these double-strand breaks, the cell repairs them in, in a very error-prone fashion. So um, one of the really nice features of the Cas9 system is it actually has two different nuclease domains, a rub c like domain uh, and an H and H domain. Uh, the H and H domain is responsible for cleaving the target DNA strand. That's the strand that is hybridized to the guide RNA. And the rub c domain cuts the non-target strand. So 
uh, what's been was shown very early on is that the uh, either one of these or both uh, nuclease domains could be mutated and could generate uh, nickase enzymes or dead Cas9 enzymes. Um, so a really nice feature of the system. Um, so um, one of the questions we had was first, uh, can this non-target strand, which forms an R loop upon displacement by the guide RNA and annealing to the target strand, can this actually serve as a primer for reverse transcription? It's a sort of disordered in the structure. You can't really see uh, much of it if you look at Cas9 crystal structures or cryome structures, but uh, sort of from that, you would infer that there might be some flexibility in that R loop. So that was a question that we didn't know the answer to early on. Um, so one of the things, of course, that we would want to do is make this into a nickase, not a nucleus. So we avoid double strand break formation. So that's really straightforward to do. You can inactivate this H and H domain with a simple point mutation and therefore avoid double strand break generation. And then sort of the question was, where could we put this RNA template? You can actually choose you know, either side of the RNA. You could stick it in the middle somewhere of this guide RNA, but really can we just append an RNA sequence on the end of this guide RNA that would template the edit. Uh, and we kind of call these uh, prime editing guide RNAs, uh, as we'll see a little bit later, that are uh, sort of dual function, uh, have that search uh, feature of the, of, the, of the single guide RNA and also have this edit replace feature. Um, so sort of the thought we had. And then the last piece that we would need is a reverse transcriptase enzyme. Um, there's probably not a lot, I mean, there's a little bit of a debate about this, but probably not a lot of reverse transcriptase activity in a cell and probably not that would localize to uh, an edit region. So adding a, a reverse transcriptase to the system, either by fusion or expressing separately was sort of a thought to be necessary for this. So, so basically this is ultimately the design that we settled on. And it looks something like what's shown on the left. Um, we designed this prime editor fusion protein, which is comprised of a Cas9 nickase, uh, again, that has one of the two nuclease domains uh, uh, mutated, fused to a reverse transcriptase enzyme. And we are pairing that with a prime editing guide RNA or PEG RNA. Uh, it contains the same features as a standard uh, single guide RNA from uh, the CRISPR system, but uh, on the three prime end in particular, we have appended this edit template sequence. So uh, there's different features of this sequence that are very important uh, and optimization of which are very important to get high efficiency. Uh, but essentially they contain sequence that allows it to prime uh, and template uh, and edit. So the first step that we kind of envisioned would happen with this molecular machine is that the nicking of this non-target R-loop strand of DNA would liberate this single-stranded DNA primer that could anneal to a design sequence in the PEG RNA that's made to be perfectly complementary. So it's essentially a primer binding site built into that RNA molecule. And uh, we hypothesized that this uh, particular intermediate would be perfectly poised to undergo reverse transcription by the associated RT enzyme, which could then copy uh, that uh, edited sequence uh, directly into the genomic DNA. Um, so uh, the product uh, would be presumably this sort of um, uh, shown here where we've incorporated this red sequence, which is the edit, as well as some sequence downstream of the edit that's homologous to the target site that we um, would, would predicted would facilitate uh, incorporation of that edit. So to just really answer that question first about can the molecular machine even function the way we we designed it to. We did some in vitro biochemistry experiments. Um, I don't, don't want to get into too many details of that, but essentially we have provided substrates of DNA uh, that have fluorescent labels on them that could be uh, potentially used for this reaction. And we provide PEG RNA, uh, Cas9 nickase or dead Cas9, just depending on the substrate we were using. And then of course, all the things that are required for reverse transcription. So a reverse transcriptase enzyme derived from uh, NMLV and, and DNPPs. And then we were able to take the products of these reactions uh, and uh, evaluate them on a denature and cage gel. Uh, and what we saw was that uh, this is a uh, sort of a nicked product that you would get from simply adding the Cas9 nickase enzyme. This is the unnicked full length substrate. And what we found is when we provided the uh, PEG RNA and reverse transcription enzyme and DNPPs, uh, we generated this product here, which is the reverse transcription product, uh, at least the the designed one. And we actually were able to pull that uh, band out of a gel uh, and Sanger sequence that, and indeed it matched the desired edit that we were trying to encode. Um, so uh, that was really encouraging to see that this whole system, uh, when you put the components together, at least in vitro biochemically, could function. Um, but then there was a question of what would actually happen if you did that to DNA. So we're obviously not making the complete edit with that prime editor. Uh, we're simply generating uh, this three prime flap sequence that contains an edit. So really the question was, can this incorporate 
into double-stranded DNA and make edits on both strands. So what we kind of thought might happen was because we have homology right here on the three prime end of that flap, we thought that maybe that flap could equilibrate with the uh, corresponding five prime flap strand by sort of strand uh, invasion and generate this five prime flap sequence that uh, is the unedited strand. So this is sort of the redundant sequence that was there to begin with. And what we, we realized is that that actually resembles uh, intermediates of uh, lagging strand DNA synthesis uh, and long patch phase excision repair. And in fact, um, uh, in lagging strand synthesis where Okazaki fragments are used, uh, the uh, polymerase will uh, do strand displacement synthesis of the downstream Okazaki fragment. Uh, and there's a very efficient system to remove those uh, five prime flaps, uh, primarily by an enzyme called FEN1 or flap endonuclease one. Um, and we thought that that could therefore um, you know, potentially remove this extra sequence that's seen in our uh, prime ending intermediate and therefore uh, lead to incorporation at least into one strand of DNA, the edit. Um, so uh, if that indeed happened, we'd be left with this heteroduplex of DNA where one strand contains the edit and the other does not. Uh, and then we thought that either DNA repair by uh, mismatch repair mechanisms or even by DNA synthesis across that uh, edited strand could lead to editing in both those strands of DNA. And maybe keep this in mind, I won't talk too much about the DNA repair mechanisms involved in prime editing, but they are very important, especially mismatch repair, and manipulating those pathways or trying to trick the cell uh, into choosing the edited strand to retain as part of uh, the sort of tricks that we use to get prime editing to work well. So I wanted to test if this sort of DNA repair mechanism could work. And the first experiment I did uh, to do that was actually in yeast, not in human cells. So uh, we use this plasmid reporter where there's a GFP uh, and an M cherry uh, separated by uh, either a stop codon or a frame shift mutation. And essentially, without any type of uh, change to that sequence, uh, so no editing occurring, uh, when transfected or transformed into yeast, you would expect just GFP expression in the colonies because the, the uh, downstream M cherry is no longer in frame or is, uh, has a stop codon upstream. Um, but if there is editing, you would expect a double positive GFPM cherry colony to form. Um, so what we did was we took these plasmid uh, reporter constructs, we uh, treated them with the prime editing system, uh, and, and then transformed the plasmid. So we uh, you know, envisioned that we were generating that three prime flap intermediate in a test tube, and then the DNA that we delivered to yeast uh, could be repaired as a, however the yeast chose to do that. What we saw is that we could indeed see some, I'm not sure how clear it is on the screen, but we indeed could see some yellow yeast colonies that are generated uh, after doing this uh, in vitro biochemical prime editing event um, that can correct the stop codon. We also found that it could correct a one base pair deletion and also a one base pair insertion. So uh, while this is in yeast and looking back, yeast is very good at homologous recombination. So it's not 100% clear that this had to go through the same mechanism that a human cell would go through. At least there is some evidence that uh, the DNA repair machinery can incorporate and edit when it's provided in the form of this three prime DNA flap. So that was really encouraging to move on. Uh, we, we figured we'd had both the molecular machinery aspect and the potentially uh, DNA repair and cells aspect working. So uh, this is what got us uh, excited about going into human cells. And so our very first experiments in human cells, like, like many things were not successful. And at first, you know, uh, we, were, we were using um, a Cas9 nickase enzyme fused to a wild type uh, marine leukemia virus reverse transcriptase. Um, which is commonly used for biotechnology applications, you know, you know, RT-PPCR and such. So it's a very good enzyme. And luckily, because people have used it so frequently and engineered it to be more efficient, there are many uh, uh, mutations in the literature and in the, in the patents uh, that we could um, uh, take and incorporate into our prime editor protein to try to improve its activity. So this is sort of the P1 protein, it's a wild type enzyme fused. Uh, this is a particular site in the human genome that we're targeting called EMX1. We're trying to make a very precise G to T edit in hex cells. Uh, and one of the things we found out very early on is that if the primer binding site is too short, we really just can't get any editing. This was actually in contrast to the in vitro experiments where five bases or six bases was sufficient to prime reverse transcription. So there's some requirement for a longer uh, primer binding site in our PEG RNA. You can see as we made it longer and longer and longer, we finally got to sort of a, a maximum of maybe three to 4% editing with this wild type. Um, marine leukemia, leukemia virus enzyme. Um, so when we went to incorporate multiple different mutations into that, we had various iterations of that, uh, these uh, different uh, RT, engineered RT enzymes, um, but the one we picked that we call PE2, 
has five different mutations, and we can see that its activity is now very substantially improved over that wild type enzyme. Um, where we weren't really seeing any prime editing before with these uh, certain peg RNA designs, we're now seeing some, and then uh, the maximal editing is, is greater than twofold uh, better. Um, so I'll just uh, also mention here that in, you know, if any of you have ever tried to do prime editing, uh, you might realize that there is some optimization required to get high efficiency, and this primer binding site length is one of those parameters that you can screen to optimize. Um, the other is the length of the template that's going to be reverse transcribed. And, it has a similar profile, though often a little bit more jagged in terms of where the optimal uh, lengths are. So these are sort of the things that we commonly do to optimize prime editing efficiency. Um, so that was the PE2 system. And then in the PE3 system, this relates to trying to trick the cell's DNA repair machinery to incorporate the edit. Uh, we actually provide an additional single guide RNA that targets the other strand of DNA downstream of where the prime editor targets uh, and introduces a nick there. So uh, in, in mismatch repair, one of the strongest signals for uh, replacing a strand of DNA is that, that strand having a nick inside of it. And in E. coli, it's methylation related, but in, in human cells, it's, it's really by, led by nicks. That's because in lagging strand synthesis, that's the newly, newly synthesized DNA strand that's presumably where errors are occurring uh, during replication. And then uh, those, those um, nicks that are in that lagging strand really can direct mismatch repair. So we're kind of taking a trick from the, uh, the base editing system, which also introduces a NIC uh, to, to drive DNA mismatch repair to that particular strand. And but we're just doing it here with prime editing by providing a second guide RNA. We, we call that system PE3. And so if you look at some of the data on the right, um, uh, particularly this RNF2 example, this is just a PE2 system where we're making a particular point mutation edit. And we can get about 10% editing with just the PE2 system. But when we add a NIC, Nicking guide that nicks about 41 base, base pairs downstream of the peg RNA induced nick. You can see we get about fourfold improvement in prime editing efficiency. Um, but not every nick gives you the same result. For example, if you nick a little further down, you only get about a twofold improvement. And across different sites, that relationship changes. Uh, one of the things you might also uh, realize, and, and sorry, I think I left out the, the legend for this. Uh, the, the colored bars are the desired edit, but the uh, gray bars are the undesired indel byproducts. Because now we're generating uh, potentially a situation where both strands of DNA are nicked at the same time, and those could potentially evolve into double strand breaks that are, are prepared by those end joining pathways that lead to messy outcomes. So uh, uh, the added uh, increase in efficiency is coming at the cost of sometimes increased byproducts. But um, in a lot of cases, actually, this nicking guide position can be uh, optimized so that you still get the benefit uh, in desired editing without much increase in. Uh, in the indel byproduct. And one of the other ways that we can uh, try to uh, get around these indel byproducts is to use sort of a special nicking guide RNA. Uh, we call the system P3B, which actually contains a spacer sequence that has the edit information uh, inside of it. So imagine that we got to the heteroduplex stage of DNA repair for prime editing, where one strand's edited, that's the one with the Y, the other strand is still unedited, that's one with the X. We can make this spacer so that it binds uniquely to this edited strand and then introduces a nick into the uh, alternative strand. Uh, and, and this sort of the, the hypothesis here was that we'd separate in time when these two nicks are occurring, the prime editor or peg RNA induced nick and the single guide RNA induced nick, because this nick couldn't happen until that first edited strand goes in. And in fact, we do see a lot of improvement uh, in the editing outcomes when we use this P3B system. Uh, if you compare these data here, again, P2, about 10% editing, P3, you get a big increase in editing at the cost of some indels. And when we use the P3B nicking guide strategy, we actually get even better editing and uh, much lower indels. Uh, this is for two different edits at the same site. Uh, and uh, this example on the right, uh, the, the FANC-F locus uh, is even more dramatic. We, we started with about 10% editing with the P2 able to get it up over 20% with P3, but almost as many indels were forming uh, as the desired edit. And if you use the P3B strategy, uh, essentially our indels go away entirely. So, um, you know, when this is possible, it's not always possible because there's some dependence on TAM sequences being, being present in the target site. But when it's possible, we really prefer this strategy because it seems to provide all the benefits without the drawbacks um, of, of, of P3. Um, so with this system, because you have so much flexibility in that PEG RNA and what that PEG RNA encodes, you can make all sorts of edits. So 
uh, we demonstrated that you can make uh, any really any point mutation edits at a particular site. Uh, we're changing a target A base to any of the other three bases, a target C, G, or T to any of the other three bases for those uh, nucleotides, so all possible 12 base, base conversions. We also showed you can do small insertions and deletions, so you can insert just a single base pair or three base pairs. You can also delete uh, similarly one or three base pairs with, with, with ease. Um, and uh, I think also significantly in, in an area where we're definitely trying to push uh, more into this direction is you can do larger deletions and insertions. So you can make 25 or 80 base pair deletions or, or insertions of things like his tags or LOXP recombination sites, uh, which have a lot of applications that I'll touch on a little bit later in terms of how you can uh, couple prime editing with, with other systems. Uh, and, and one of the advantages that I want to point out about prime editing that I think really enables a lot of what you can do with the system is that uh, it has a really large editing window in principle. So uh, typically with Cas9 or HDR, the edits um, really, uh, the efficiency starts to fall off as the uh, changes move further and further away from the break site. Uh, and similarly, if, if those of you that have worked with base editing, uh, you know that at least with respect to the PAM sequence and the target site, uh, the window for base editing is somewhat narrow and um, uh, restricted to that region. So it's a little bit dependent on PAMs that are properly placed with respect to your target nucleotide. Um, however, prime editing really can make edits uh, from the point of the NIC uh, in the uh, non-target DNA strand, sort of three prime of that uh, for uh, upwards of 30 or more bases away. So it really makes the technology less dependent on having a PAM in the perfect place for the edit that you'd like to make. Um, so we were able to demonstrate that we can make edits 12 base pairs down from the NIC or 20 or 30 uh, using this, this RTT template or reverse transcription template of 34 bases. So really, if you make this longer and longer, it seems that uh, there isn't really a restriction on uh, being able to introduce edits far away from the NIC. Uh, it's really just about getting a PEG-RNA that's that size to work well, which is not always as, as easy, but uh, definitely is possible. So if we kind of go back and look at this pie chart that I introduced at the very beginning, um, you know, and you think about what prime editing can do in principle, what it could be used to, what types of mutations it could be used to address, we see that, you know, of these mutations cataloged in ClinVar, which is um, but by far not perfect in terms of capturing all the genetic variants that, that exist, but uh, you can tally up all these different uh, types of changes and see that about 90% of those could in principle, again, in principle be addressed by prime editing. So just to demonstrate a few examples of this for um, actually pathogenic alleles, um, we are able to uh, uh, take the beta hemoglobin uh, gene uh, and knock in the, uh, the, uh, the E6V mutation that's found in sickle cell disease. Uh, and then also, so we were able to do that with about 45% efficiency and also correct that mutation with about 60% uh, efficiency. Uh, we were able to uh, introduce and again, correct uh, this four base pair uh, insertion uh, that is commonly seen in Tay-Sachs disease. Uh, and also uh, we were able to install a, a point mutant in the PRNP protein that actually makes uh, people resistant to prion disease. So uh, an interesting thought of how you might apply prime editing for healthy people. Um, and one of the things we were really eager to look at uh, for prime editing was the uh, off-target effects. So uh, as all of you may be aware, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 systems have uh, been found to have off-target locations in the genome where they can edit, uh, which is undesirable for obviously for clinical applications. Uh, this top panel is showing uh, multiple different sites in the genome uh, where Cas9 has been shown to have an off-target effect. So these are, the target site is uh, HEC3 and these are multiple different off-target locations. And we're using single guide RNAs or PEG RNAs and uh, transfecting with Cas9 nuclease and looking at off-target indels. And, and in some of these cases, you're seeing really high off-target editing at these uh, other loci in the genome. Uh, when you do this with prime editing, uh, the situation is very different. At many off-target sites, you just simply see no editing, no indels or edits at all. Uh, I think this is in part due to the fact that we're not generating double-strand breaks. So as a nickase, uh, you're less likely to make an edit just by nicking the DNA. There was a particular site where actually by coincidence, its homology to the, the target site was so high that you actually would probably predict there to be prime editing happening there if in fact the, the Cas9 sequence was able to target a NIC. Actually, we we're able to redesign these, depending on the design of this PEG RNA, and actually design it in such a way that it 
no longer really works well with that off-target site. You can take advantage of, of the differences between the on-target and off-target sequence and actually eliminate that off-target activity. I'll say beyond our work that we did very early on, many others have looked at the off-target profile for, Chris, uh, for prime editing systems and really haven't found a lot. And so it's been very encouraging so far from a safety perspective, uh, how a little off-target editing we're seeing with prime editing. So I, I wanted to introduce one other sort of uh, follow on to that original work uh, that we did um, and, and that I did it with others in the Lou Lab, um, which is uh, this twin prime editing system, or sometimes we call it dual flap prime editing. Uh, this is a system that kind of uh, in many ways is similar to our P3 system. We're using two guide RNAs to target either strand of DNA, but actually now we're using two peg RNAs. And the idea is here that we will uh, have one peg RNA target the top strand, one will target the bottom strand. Both will nick and template reverse transcription of new DNA sequence shown here in red. And that new DNA sequence is actually usually designed to be very different from the sequence that's at the target site. Uh, and, and, and in such a way that they can, these two new three prime flaps synthesized on either strand of DNA can come together and anneal. Uh, and it turns out that uh, when this happens, it seems that cells will remove the uh, sort of intervening sequence, these overhanging five prime ends. And what you end up with uh, is basically replacement of the sequence between the mix with this new DNA sequence. Uh, so we call this twin prime editing or dual flap prime editing. And, and functionally, again, it just replaces what's in between the two uh, protospacers with whatever sequence you encoded on these peg RNAs. Um, so when we first started doing experiments with the system, we were kind of astonished about how efficient it could be. Um, so we wanted to look at sort of how it works uh, and some of the different designs that might influence the editing outcomes. One of the things we did was ask the question, how much overlap does there need to be between these two new three prime flap sequences? So we could make peg RNAs that had reverse transcription templates of different length that would lead to different amounts of overlap. Uh, and then ask the question of how this affects editing efficiency. So uh, in this particular example, uh, we're seeing very high editing efficiency really across the board with these different amounts of overlap. Uh, when we introduce this 38 base pair BXB1 recombinase attachment site sequence. Um, and uh, we see that the purity of the products is improved when we use longer uh, amounts of um, overlap between the two flaps. So you can see the editing efficiency is high here and the indels are slightly lower than this other extreme where we have less overlap and see higher indels, slightly lower editing. So it does seem that it is uh, dependent on that amount of overlap, but not, not in a way that it requires 100% overlap for sure. Um, and we also similarly use this to do a 50 base pair insertion a slightly lower editing efficiency, but still pretty, pretty good. Um, uh, and this is a similar uh, attachment site sequence, actually just the partner of this, this at B, the at P sequence. Um, so the other thing that we were uh, excited to demonstrate with this dual flat prime editing system was the ability to, ex uh, to excise uh, sequences. So uh, we chose this as an example, uh, a particular exon, exon 51 in, in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, the DMD gene. Uh, we could delete that by uh, basically targeting sequences and the uh, introns flanking that exon and resulting in a pretty large over 500 base pair deletion uh, with, with uh, relatively good efficiency. Um, and the other really sort of, I think, exciting application of this dual flap technology is to potentially replace uh, entire regions of, re uh, uh, of coding sequence with, with new recoded DNA sequence. Um, the reason we like this approach is because uh, in in many diseases, there are multiple mutations that are found across different patients. Making a bespoke peg RNA to fix that one mutation uh, has some challenges. Um, so if you could make one prime editing system that, for example, can target most of the mutations in exon seven of, of PAH that causes PKU, it could be very attractive. Um, so we're able to show with various different optimizations, including these EPEG RNAs that I won't discuss, you can get pretty uh, good efficiency, uh, almost 30% of correcting uh, or sort of recoding the 64 base pair sequence in, in exon 7 of PH. So it's something that we're kind of excited about moving with, uh, forward with uh, in the future. So the sort of other thing that we wanted to do with this full flap prime editing technology was to pair it with uh, site-specific recombinase enzymes. I showed you that the prime editing system could be used to integrate recombinase target site with, with pretty high efficiency. Uh, at a chosen location in the genome. And if you subsequently take that recombinase enzyme and some donor DNA, uh, you can uh, 
after that twin prime editing event writes in the attachment site, the genome, you could integrate that large DNA cargo. So now this sort of in a two-step process enables targeted integration of large pieces of DNA. And we were able to show that this could work with, uh, with you know, pretty low efficiency, but um, at least uh, something I think that's still useful uh, in, in, in cell culture, um, you know, around or between five and 10% in a few different examples at these sort of safe harbor low size CCR5 and AABS1. Um, and, and I'll just mention that you could also in principle use these recombinases to invert or delete uh, DNA. Uh, you wouldn't require any DNA donor. You would just uh, multiplex integrate those two uh, recombinase sites and they could be used to do all the things that you normally do with recombinases. So this was around the time that I made my transition from from the Broad Institute over uh, in David Liu's lab to Prime Medicine, which is the company uh, that we spun out uh, of this work. And just to give you guys a little bit, you probably don't know a lot about our company, just give you a little bit uh, of, of history. We, we hired our first employees about mid 2020, kind of in the peak of the pandemic days. So that was, that was interesting trying to get a company off the ground uh, in those days. Uh, but currently we're about 200 employees and about roughly 85% uh, are in research uh, and technical development. So very focused on the research stage of things at this point. And we're located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, also have a chemistry facility in Watertown. We did our IPO uh, in October of last year, and we've nominated our first development candidate uh, early this year for a disease called chronic granulomatous disease, or, or CGD, and I'll show you a little bit of data uh, from that program in the second half of this talk. So you know, at, at Prime Medicine, we're really trying to take advantage of the full suite of prime editing uh, technology. So this sort of single flap PE2 and PE3 system that I started off talking about uh, to fix you know, point mutations, small insertions, and deletions. Um, we're also, though, very interested in applying this twin prime editing or dual flap technology that I shared uh, just recently. And we, we think there are various applications for this. Uh, one is in the excision of expanded repeat sequences, which uh, obviously are incredibly uh, uh, debilitating disorders and very challenging to treat. We're interested in this idea of editing mutation hotspots, like I showed for the example for PKU, and also just integrating things at safe harbor locations in the genome. And then again, pairing that uh, system with uh, recombinase enzymes to achieve uh, the integration of larger pieces of DNA. So I'll share a little bit of an example of that in, in T cells. So I'll also just mention that we're not, as my, our CEO likes to say, not using your grandma's prime editing anymore, and there have been multiple uh, improvements to the technology that I, I don't really have time to share. Uh, these two dual flap and pairing with recombinase I already spoke about, but there are these engineered prime editing guide RNAs that have extra three prime RNA motifs added that stabilize those and, and can really increase the editing efficiency. Um, we've found that the mismatch repair system that sort of uh, restricts prime editing outcomes. And if you can inhibit that system, either by knockdown of mismatch repair genes or the introduction of dominant negative proteins, you can increase prime editing efficiency. So we call those systems P4 and P5. Um, we've also had our own suite of internal developments at Prime Medicine that are a little different from these uh, and have made uh, uh, more engineered reverse transcriptase enzymes and other proteins that uh, enhance the efficiency of prime editing. So this is the, our pipeline. It's a quite an ambitious pipeline for a company of 200 people. Um, but you know, just to try to give you a little bit of insight into how we thought about this, uh, given this is really new technology and there's many places we could potentially go with it, we didn't want to restrict ourselves in, in how we uh, went about choosing indications. But we did want to have some sort of early successes and uh, proof of concept uh, in the clinic. So this first category of indications that we chose, we kind of fit in this immediate category. And it includes things like sickle cell disease that we actually program or partner that program with theme therapeutics, a chronic granulomas disease, which I'll share with you today, and banconia anemia. These are all blood uh, HSE-based uh, programs. And there's also been a lot of precedent now for delivery to the liver in vivo with lipid nanoparticles using CRISPR systems. And we're really encouraged by those results that, that have been shared by other companies. And so we've targeted some mutations in Wilson's disease and glycogen storage disease type 1B uh, where uh, prime editing can make the, the corrections. Uh, and then also there's been uh, examples of using gene editing and, and gene therapy more broadly in the eye. So we have uh, programs in retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, and then uh, we also have some uh, early programs in the ear where, where uh, these compartments make it a little bit more amenable to delivery with, with viral systems like AAB. Uh, and then this is where we start to think a little bigger and these are a little bit more ambitious in terms of uh, uh, the scope of these indications, but we're really excited about the possibility of using prime editing to target uh, repeat expansion diseases. 
So things like Friedrich's ataxia, iotonic dystrophy, ALS caused by C9 or 72 repeat expansion, sort of uh, these list of others, including Huntington's disease. Uh, these are all very challenging based because of the uh, sort of delivery hurdle to get the prime editing systems to the right tissues. Some of them also affect multi, multiple organs. And so the delivery hurdles are you know, still very real for us, but our belief is that there'll be improvements to those delivery technologies that will allow us to access those tissues and then our editing system uh, kind of ready to go. So we're excited about sort of the long-term potential and we call this our differentiation category. And similarly in, in DMD and in cystic fibrosis, we also feel that we can make very uh, you know, unique edits that would be uh, really uh, I think efficacious in those systems, but we're still waiting a little bit on the delivery solutions. Um, so I'm gonna start off by just sharing a little bit about our CGD work. Um, you know, this is a, a, a somewhat rare disease that affects uh, children. It, it leads to debilitating infections, and it's really due to this loss of enzyme activity uh, from NADPH oxidase, which is uh, found in white blood cells and is used to uh, generate oxidative bursts to kill uh, microbes. Um, so any, this complex has five different proteins. Loss of any one of them would cause CGD, but um, uh, there are two in particular that are common, one in X-linked CGD, loss of NOx2, and then P47 Fox that, uh, that is encoded by NCF1 uh, is, is sort of uh, causes most of the autosomal recessive forms of CGD. And so this is our target. We'd like to fix uh, a very common mutation that's found in, in, in a very large percentage of patients with uh, autosomal recessive uh, CGD in, in NCF1. It's a two base pair deletion mutation. And, and our approach here is would be to take the hematopoietic stem cells from the patient. So an autologous therapy, we correct ex vivo, uh, this two base pair deletion and NCF1, and then return those cells back to the patients where they can engraft and reconstitute their blood system. And so the genetics of NCF1 are a little interesting. Um, uh, the gene itself is flanked by two pseudogenes uh, uh, on either side, NCF1B and NCF1C. Both of these pseudogenes actually contain that exact same two base pair deletion. Uh, and interestingly, they're probably otherwise functional except for the fact that they have this frame shift uh, in, in, in one of their exons. And what happens in patients with CGD, it's thought that there's a sort of gene conversion event that actually transfers this two base pair deletion uh, into the uh, actual NCF1 gene and inactivates it. So now you're kind of in this interesting situation where you have six copies of something that is otherwise very similar um, uh, and maybe six chances to edit or six shots on goal to correct uh, that mutation. And this actually also presents a lot of challenges for using uh, double strand break generating technologies because as you might imagine, if you make a break in the pseudogene at that site, as well as uh, the target NCF1 gene or the other pseudogene, you can get large deletions actually uh, between that and lose uh, 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 600 kilobases actually of DNA uh, that spans that region. So it makes it a little challenging to apply uh, double strand break editing approaches. So we thought this would be a really great case for using crime editing. So what we, again, basically are gonna do, we were very fortunate to have collaborators at the NIH that can provide us with patient cells to test this approach. Uh, we're gonna take these uh, CD34 stem cells, uh, treat them with prime editors. And the idea is if you were to differentiate these into the myeloid cells, uh, uh, the hope was that actually correction of any pseudogene or the NCF1 gene itself would lead to uh, restored expression of P47 FOX and uh, the NADPH oxidase complex. Um, so uh, when we do that, uh, you know, this, this, this next set of data is basically gonna show you that uh, we can use prime editing to correct that mutation. So uh, in CD34 cells, we can look at the clones and see that about 80% of them contain a correction after prime editing uh, compared to none pre-editing. Pre um, we can see that we've restored expression of the P47 Fox gene product uh, at about 80% relative to wild type healthy cells. Uh, and we can see that we've now also uh, restored the oxidase activity using this DHR oxidation assay. Again, around 80% in the edited cell population compared to the healthy donors. Uh, so we've been able to correct from genotype and demonstrate that we've restored function and phenotype in these cells. Um, and then a very important uh, sort of part of the a preclinical path here is to show that these uh, cells that we've edited in vitro can uh, be uh, uh, grafted back into uh, an animal and uh, reconstitute the long-term hematopoietic stem cell population. Um, so what we've been able to do is we take these uh, stem cells, we treat them with prime editors, uh, we cryopreserve those cells, uh, and then reintroduce those cells into immunodeficient mice that can uh, uh, that allow for engraftment of human uh, stem cells. 
and we wait 16 weeks and see what's, what's in the bone marrow at that time. Uh, and one of the really good things that we saw is that the prime editing uh, uh, system, as well as the unedited controls, both engraft very well into these mice. So about 95% of the cells that are in the bone marrow uh, are uh, made of human uh, cells, not, uh, not mouse cells. So they are engrafting very efficiently compared, uh, and as well as the controls. Uh, and then moreover, these long-term engrafted uh, stem cells are edited. So they have about the same editing efficiency as the cells that went in. So we're not losing any of those cells uh, by failure to engraft. So we think that prime editing is a, a very or sufficiently gentle a process to, to allow those HSCs to maintain their, their stemness. Uh, and also, if you look at these HSCs and, and differentiate them, the, the lineages are not skewing compared to the controls. They, they make up the same sort of uh, cell products uh, from these HSCs. Um, so I want to next move into a couple other examples. And I think I'm running a little bit uh, late on time. So I just want to show an example of doing some in vivo delivery to the liver with lipid nanoparticles. We can encapsulate prime editor mRNA with the prime editing guide RNAs in these lipids, introduce them intravenously to mice. Uh, in this particular application, we're just really trying to uh, establish that this works. So we're targeting a gene called PCSK9, and we want to introduce a stop codon at a very pre precise position of that gene to knock it out. You can see we can get over 40% prime editing uh, and very high levels of uh, serum PCSK9 uh, knockdown using the system. So uh, we think that this serves as nice validation for this approach for our, our liver programs. This is our example of cystic fibrosis. So uh, not to go into too much detail on the optimization, um, but uh, on the left here, you can see that actually when we started off trying to correct these mutations in CFTR, we were getting about 5% editing efficiency and serially optimizing the PEG RNAs in particular allows us to get uh, near 70% editing efficiency. So, so again, to reiterate, the optimization of, of, of PEG RNAs is really critical to getting good prime editing. We're targeting here a stop codon mutation uh, in, in CFTR that actually isn't expected to be treatable with Trikafta, uh, the Vertex drugs that are, are used in cystic fibrosis. So these are some um, organoid assays that we're using. They're sort of swelling assay uh, where uh, healthy uh, controls when, when treated with forskolin will swell. These mutated uh, um, organoids do not respond with that swelling, as you can see. If you treat them with Trikafta, they also don't respond as expected, given that they have lost these are stop codon mutations in, in CFTR. But if we do the prime editing of these organoids for, first, you can see that we're restoring now this swelling um, consistent with the editing that, that we see. So the last sort of major category of things that I, I'd like to talk about is uh, repeat expansion diseases. I think you guys are familiar, but essentially we all have these re repetitive sequences in our genome that are fine when they're short. Uh, but when they expand uh, hundreds or even thousands of repeats, they become pathogenic. And they can be various sequences. A lot of them are trinucleotide repeats. Some of them are hexanucleotide repeats. So they take various forms. They're in different places in the genes. So some of them can be in introns. Some of them are in exons. Some of them are in UTRs. And this really changes your approach for how you do editing and what you want to do. Of course, a coding region, you don't want to uh, lead to something that would no longer express the protein. So you have to be a little careful uh, here. They also affect multiple different types of tissues. So they affect the central nervous system, affect, uh, affect cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. So this really influences how you choose to deliver your uh, editing system. And one of the uh, repeat expansion diseases that we're, we're focused on is Friedrich's ataxia. Um, these repeats can be very long. They're GAA, trinucleotide repeats. Uh, and so we've been able to obtain patient cells that, that have hundreds of these repeats and design these dual flap prime editing systems where you target regions flanking that repeat. Uh, and these two different new flaps made by the prime editor can come together like Velcro, loop out a repeat that's in the intervening sequence, and now uh, you, you remove those repeats from the, the allele. So we can do this with relatively high efficiency, around 60%. And the other thing that we've been able to show is that when you do this, uh, the hypermethylation that actually silences uh, the gene uh, due to these repeats uh, is also removed we can restore expression um, uh, from uh, the locus. So this is showing some data where we have the healthy donor cells. You can see protaxin is made. These are patient cells that are not making protaxin. And after prime editing, we can restore expression. And we've also modeled this in DRG organoids where healthy donors, you can see these nice axon projections. These are the patient's cells uh, 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 or neuron, uh, DRG organoids derived from patient iPSC cells. So you've lost those uh, projections and then after prime editing, we can restore those, those projections. 
Uh, and, and the delivery uh, for, for this particular indication is challenging. We're right now uh, pursuing AV delivery systems. These are uh, dual AAVs. The editor is too big to fit into one AAV, so we actually have to split it in half and encode it in two separate AAVs that are co-delivered. Um, but uh, uh, despite that, this still works very well. We've been able to show that with ICV infusion, uh, we can uh, uh, get very high editing efficiency of the cells that are transduced. This is a you know, neonatal mouse where we get about 50% of the neurons transduced. And then if we do a, a local administration, we can transduce a very high percentage of the neurons at the region of injection and then edit again uh, around 80%, so a pretty high number. So this is sort of the, the uh, uh, way we're, we're pursuing delivery for these uh, CNS indications uh, at the moment, but are very eager to see if other delivery uh, possibilities will exist in the future. Uh, and so the last, I think this is the last one, is the example of uh, uh, combining prime editing with recombinase enzymes. Again, we're gonna use prime editing to incorporate the recombinase site sequence specifically, and then use a recombinase enzyme to integrate larger pieces of DNA at that location. So we've been able to do this in T cells, um, and essentially what we're, be, we're able to do is target that particular, particular locus in T cells, and get very high prime editing efficiency, around 90%, and then also integrate about three and a half KB of cargo at that site with about 60% efficiency. Um, and you can see that compared to the control cells that do not show the phenotypic response, these uh, uh, passage T cells, as we call the system, uh, uh, have a strong phenotypic response consistent with this, uh, the, uh, the observation on the uh, integration of the cargo. So we're really excited about using this as a platform. Um, there's challenges to delivering DNA to many cell types, so that is something that has to be overcome, but in T cells, they seem amenable to this, this strategy. And lastly, we were building off-target, uh, comprehensive off-target evaluation uh, uh, assays. So we're really interested in seeing if the local off-target effects that occur from Cas9 binding are leading to undesired uh, editing outcomes and also looking more broadly at the chromosomal scale to see if there's any structural changes or uh, effects from reverse transcription inside the cell. So we're really trying to build this out and prove that this is a safe technology. Um, and, and the work that we've done internally for two of our programs, the left is CJD, the right is for Wilson's disease and hepatocytes. Uh, we have a suite of assays to try to predict off-target sites, but when we actually go and look there, we really don't see any editing except for at the on-target site. So very encouraging for these particular programs that we're not seeing any off-target activity at these hundreds of other nominated sites. Um, so with that, I'll just quickly summarize. You know, we're trying to employ many different prime editing approaches. So the single flap, dual flap, and passage recombinase approach to, uh, for our therapeutic programs. We're able to edit many different cell types, including CD34 stem cells, T cells, hepatocytes, neurons. Um, so really opening up a lot of opportunities for where we can apply the technology. Uh, we can fix all types of pathogenic variants, you know, uh, base pair substitutions, uh, and small deletions, and even repeat sequences can be excised. Um, and we're really pursuing a, a variety of different delivery systems, including LNP uh, in the liver and outside of the liver, as well as uh, AABs uh, to, to deliver to the CNS. Uh, and we're really excited about our sort of lead program here uh, that uh, is showing a lot of good activity, low off-target editing, uh, and uh, looking forward to pushing that into the clinic. So uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you all for your attention.